I'm going to show you 5 EF Core performance tips to improve the speed of your application queries. I'm sure some of these are going to be surprising, so let's jump straight into the code. The first tip I want to highlight is using no tracking queries in a read-only scenario. So I'm going to write two queries. One is going to fetch something from the database using a tracking query, and the other one is going to do the same with a no tracking query. So first of all, I'm going to create my database context instance, and I'm going to define it inside of a using statement. And then my query is going to fetch a set of sales from the database. So I'm going to say context and then sales, and I'm looking for sales for a particular salesperson. So I'm going to say where the salesperson ID is, for example, 10. And I'm going to immediately replace this with a constant that I call the salesperson ID. So let's go ahead and define this. So this will be a private const integer. Let's call it the salesperson ID. And I'll give it the value of 10. Then I'm just going to say to list async all of the sales for this salesperson from the database. And we can return this sales from the method. And then in the no tracking version of this query, we can do the same thing. So I'm going to copy the implementation from the previous method. And the only thing I'm going to change here is to introduce as no tracking. So let's run the benchmark and see how big of a performance difference something like this could make. Here are the benchmark results for our tracking and no tracking queries. And you can see that the no tracking query is significantly faster than the same query with tracking turned on. And it also has less memory allocation because we are working in a read only scenario. EF core query tracking is a very powerful feature that's helpful when you actually want to make some updates to the database. But if you only want to query your entities in a read only scenario, it's very important that you use a no tracking query. The next thing I want to show you is to highlight the difference that the number of columns that you fetch from the database can make on the performance of your query. So what I'm going to do here is to define a constant that's going to represent the salesperson identifier and we're going to be querying some sales from the database just like in the previous example. The difference is this time I'm going to be loading the sales into a custom DTO object instead of loading my entities. So we're going to be applying projections in our query and I'm going to show you two versions with selecting everything and selecting just what you need. So let's write the first version of this query and I'm going to start by defining a new database context. And then for my query, what I'm going to do is select the sales from my context and this is just an I queryable. Then I can define a filter to select only the sales for this particular salesperson ID. And then I want to apply a projection. So this is a way to return something else from your database other than your entity. And you can project into any type that you define in your code. In this case, we want to project into the sales DTO that I defined below. So I'm going to create a new sales DTO object. In this example, I'm going to assign all of the properties from the sales object in the database. So let me assign the product ID, also the quantity for this particular sale. And lastly, I'm going to assign the actual salesperson ID. We already know this, but let's return it from the database regardless. And then I'm going to say to list async. Let's return this list of sales from the database. And then I'm going to copy this implementation into the other benchmark. And let's say that we only need a particular set of columns from the database. Now, this is a very frequent situation where you end up overfetching from the database, which is going to cost you in terms of performance. So for the particular query that I'm implementing, I actually only care about the product ID and the salesperson ID. So this seems like a small difference, but even something like this could make a performance impact. So let me show you the benchmark results. Here are the benchmark results, and you can see that the performance is almost identical between these two queries. The only difference is the allocation. So you can see that the version where we are loading less data from the database obviously has less allocation. If you extrapolate this on a larger data model with a lot more columns, the performance difference becomes significant because the amount of data sent over the network is going to have an impact on the performance. And you will see that the query speed is going to start to change in favor of the smaller query, which is selecting less data. But I want to show you something else. So let's say that this particular query 
is really important for us. Is there a way that we can speed this up further? Well, one thing you could do is to define an index in your database context. So I'm going to create an index on the sale entity. I'm going to index on the salesperson identifier, which is also the foreign key to the salesperson table. And I'm going to include a set of properties on my index. And I'm just going to add the product ID, which is also the value that we are fetching in this query. If I update the database and define this index, suddenly this will become a covering index, which means it's going to perfectly satisfy the requirements of my query. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add this index to the database and rerun the benchmark. You can see the results are quite different this time because the second query where we fetch only the columns that we need is almost twice as fast as the query where we are loading all of the columns. Now this is because we can perfectly use the index that I just created which contains the salesperson ID and also includes the product ID which means the database is only going to query the index and return the results directly without even accessing the database. And this is why it's important to understand the database that you are using because EF Core can only give you so much. Let's jump into the next example where I'm going to show you the impact relationships can have on your EF queries. So I'm going to define the same salesperson ID as before, and I'm going to add my sales DTO object. And the difference is it's going to include the salesperson first and last name. This information isn't available in the sales table. So we're going to have to do a join between the sales and the salesperson tables to be able to access this data. I'm going to implement the first version of this query and I want to do an explicit include statement in this example. So let's start by creating the database context and let's write the database query. So I'm going to say context sales, then I'm going to filter on the salesperson ID, then I'm going to project the sales into my sales DTO object and call to list async. And finally, I'm just going to return the sales from this method. So what I'm doing here is accessing the salesperson navigation property on my sale entity to be able to get the first and last name which lives in another table. And what I'm going to do in this benchmark is to define an explicit include statement. I'm going to tell EF Core to explicitly include the salesperson when querying the database. You might be surprised that something like this could have an impact on performance. So I'm going to copy this implementation here and reuse it in the second example. And I'm just going to get rid of the explicit include. These queries are going to be functionally the same because EF will be able to translate this even without an include statement. So let's see what are the benchmark results. Here are the benchmark results and you can see that the version with an implicit include is slightly faster than when we explicitly define an include statement in our link queries. This is definitely a small performance difference, but I'm consistently seeing better performance in case of implicit includes. And it's really surprising that something like an explicit include statement in a projection, which is already a no tracking query could have an impact, but you should definitely get rid of your include statements if you're already doing an implicit include in your queries. The next thing I want to show you is a slightly newer EF core feature and it's called split queries. I'm also going to be querying the salesperson in this example, but we won't be using the sales table directly. Rather, what I want to do is to fetch the salesperson DTO together with a list of sales for this salesperson. Now for the sales, I'm only going to be fetching the sales ID and the product ID to make the memory footprint smaller. But let's see what will the performance be between a regular query fetching this data and a split query. The regular query will look like this. I'm querying the salesperson's table, looking for the salesperson with the identifier of 10. And then I'm going to project this into a salesperson DTO. And I'm also going to take the sales for this salesperson and project them into a sales DTO and convert that into a list. We're doing an implicit include here from the salesperson to the sales table. And in the regular query, this is going to be converted into a join between these two tables. However, you can write this as a split query and I'm going to show you how. The only change you need to make is to say that this is a split 
query by calling the asSplitQuery method. So what this is going to do is split any queries that would normally be a join into multiple SQL queries. So in this example, we're going to query the sales table to fetch this data and then send another query to fetch the sales data. So we're actually sending two database queries. And in this example, everything will be one database query with a join between these two tables. So let's see if this has any performance impact. So here are the benchmark results, and you can see that the split query is significantly faster than the regular query with a join. Even though it's doing two database queries, it's more efficient in this example and executes faster than just executing one query with a join, and it has less memory allocation. So split queries are a very interesting new addition that you can do in EF Core, and they can give you some really nice performance for particular queries that are heavy with joins. However, you need to be aware that each split query is going to generate multiple SQL queries to your database. So there's a trade-off to be made because you're making multiple round trips to the database, and this could also have a significant performance impact. So I wouldn't normally reach for split queries by default, but I would definitely test if they can give me better performance. And the most important performance tip I'm going to give you is the impact of pagination. Most of the time, you don't really need all of the data that's present in your database. And you can get by with just fetching the latest records from the database, and we call this pagination. So we only fetch a given page, let's say 10 records from the database, and then we can load the next page if we need more data. I'm going to be querying a simple sales DTO object, and I'm going to show you two versions of how I've seen pagination being implemented with EF Core. The first version is going to be very similar to the second one, but the differences are very big in terms of performance. What the first query here is doing is fetching all of the data from the database, then doing the pagination in memory using the skip and take methods, calculating the total number of records that are available, and then returning the data. And then in the second example, we're going to do something different. First, we're going to define our query and store that inside of a variable. Now notice that this doesn't actually execute the query in the database because this is an I queryable. And this is just a query contract that we can use to run our queries later. So we're going to use our query and then apply the skip and take operators and only then load the page sales from the database. And the difference is that this is going to load just 10 records from the database while this is going to load all of the records from the database. So you might be thinking that this might give us a performance edge because we don't have to do another query to fetch the count like we do here, but let's check out the benchmark results and see what is the difference. Here are the benchmark results and you can see that the query that is doing pagination at the database level is more than four times faster than when loading all of the data from the database. And the memory footprint is significantly smaller. This is why pagination is so critical for performance when you are working with large lists of data that you want to return from your API. And if you want to see how to apply these performance best practices to your RESTful API, then check out this video to see how I do it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons. And until next time, stay awesome.